Um, hopefully we're getting a good stream. If you're not seeing me well, shoot me a chat. I'm seeing some weird um, icons pop up on our stream messaging. So I'm hoping we're coming through well. I am checking. So it looks like we're getting some, uh, a little bit of latency and I apologize about that. Um, we'll keep pushing forward. Hopefully this will keep coming through for you and you'll be able to hear everything all right. I apologize, we were having interest. So, um, now I'm trying to get this all going, but we have two special guests with us today. Um, we've got life in the world of live streaming, right? So I'm gonna roll the here and make sure I turn down some of this audio because it's getting kind of loud. And I wanna make sure we hear our speakers today. Hi Tyler, can you hear me? I can hear you, Bob, but the audience can't hear you yet um, because I haven't finished doing the introduction and switching you over yet. So, um, welcome y'all to P B Big C Live with PoE Texas. I have uh, never gotten so, so if, so if I'm honest with y'all out there watching the live stream, I've never gotten so much sleep and eaten so healthy at a trade show ever before, and that sucks. I don't know about what you guys think, um, no dinners on expenses, nothing. And if we're going to make it, if we're going to have to spend the entire time at a trade show staring at a screen, then by golly, we're going to do make the best, do our best to make it interesting for you by giving you great content. So we've gathered top experts in the world of PoE and asked them to do some quick 30 minute presentations on relevant topics about power over ethernet for intelligent buildings, including concepting, designing, wiring, networking, and creating wellness. I'll add a link in the chat and hopefully a card somewhere here while Bob and Dave are talking where you can see all the online sessions we're doing here at PUE Texas. Now, today we're gonna to be talking about cable infrastructure for intelligent buildings. And then later this morning, we're gonna be talking to Matt Conger with Igor about how to take your intelligent building and maximize your IoT potential. And it's really a conversation about how to concept the building with your customer. So this morning, we have special guests, Bob and Dave with Seaman, who have agreed to show you the secret sauce for using cabling in an intelligent building. Bob will cover how it saves money and how you drive cost infrastructure, and Dave will show you how to do it well. So, uh, Bob Allen, let me introduce both of our speakers today. Bob Allen is a lead green associate based in Watertown, Connecticut, and Bob is part of the Seaman Company team as the global business development manager for intelligent buildings and strategic alliances. In his role, he supports the global sales team to educate both current and potential customers on the Converge IT intelligent building cabling solutions and the economic impact of intelligent building construction. Bob holds an MBA from the University of Hartford and has over 15 years of experience in the IT industry. One of his most recent accomplishments is being appointed Vice Chair of Continental Automated Building Associations, CABA Intelligent Building Council. Though he is an impressive career in IT, Bob aspires to be a professional hockey player for the NHL. Let's welcome Bob to the show here in just one second. Now, Dave's gonna help to have to make sure I pronounce this right, and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong. It is Dave Valentinakis. Valentikonis, but that's close enough. Valentikonis, <laughs> Valentikonis. Dave has corrected me, it's Valentikonis, and he joined Seaman in 1995 and has held positions in technical support and product management. He is currently the North American Technical Services Manager, where he manages an experienced team of product, application, training, and technology experts that help Seaman customers navigate a diverse and rapidly changing market. He is a Bixie RCDD, NTS, an active member of TIA, and has a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Connecticut. So y'all, let's go ahead and welcome these two fantastic presenters to the show today. 
All right, guys. Thanks, Tyler. We are live. <clears throat> We're live. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our presentation today on intelligent buildings and the infrastructure to support it. Um, first thing I'd like to talk about is just kind of the trends that we've seen out there in the industry to lead us to where we are today and, and what has made the low voltage infrastructure so relevant. And basically, it, uh, it really boils down to all of the systems in the building have now converged onto the network. Most recently, of course, being PoE lighting that we've been talking about now for at least the last uh, four or five Bixies. <clears throat> But now we're also, not only are we seeing these uh, systems collapsing on the network, it's also allowing us to think differently about how we design our buildings and how we operate them. Um, and I'm sure you're going to hear a lot of COVID talk on people's presentations uh, this week. But you know, if we look back uh, six or eight months ago, we probably didn't anticipate things like social distancing applications or um, UV disinfecting type applications within our buildings. And while things like that are deployable in legacy buildings, if we think a little bit differently about our buildings today and going forward and treat them more like an operating system, similar to uh, the operating system in your phone that allows these apps to be more plug and play, it allows us to be a lot more economical in the deployment of applications that will help our business, help keep our people safe uh, and, and everything else that goes along with that. We're also looking now at situations where being able to bring all of those systems down onto the network allows us to take great advantage of, a, um, of an integration platform. And when we use an integration platform, we can typically save about uh, half a million dollars per 100,000 square feet of construction by eliminating things like proprietary software, um, making sure that the end user, the owner of that building is not vendor locked for the life of that building, and give us the uh, option of taking advantage of the open market during the operations phase. To show an example of that, here's a project that we were involved in in Erie, Pennsylvania, where they wanted to build the most intelligent building in Erie, uh, but they were a little bit over budget. So we met with the CEO of the organization and, um, and the architect, and with the help of one of our master systems integrators and the architect identified those systems you see on the left. According to the architect, the cost to procure and deploy those systems in a more traditional model was just under $971,000. When we looked at using an integration platform and leveraging IP for all the different systems in the building, we were able to do it for about 481000 We lowered the first in cost, the capital costs or construction costs of that building by, uh, by about 49%. One of the leading technologies that were deployed in that building was a POE lighting solution. So where's this all come from? Well, the average cost in North America to bring AC power to the edge is about $1,000. We have a circuit breaker a portion of the panel, a transformer, uh, conduit, cable, and, and so on. We can bring POE to that same location for about $250, figuring about $100 for a powered port, and then about $150 for an open, open air category cable run. So if you were to leverage POE for everything that I'm aware of in a building, you'd add about 208 low voltage drops per 10,000 square feet. Uh, but keep in mind, every time we add a low voltage drop, we're eliminating an AC drop, and in most cases, an AC drop and a communication cable. So in doing that, the savings are about um, $156,000 per 10,000 square feet, or 1.56 million per 100,000 feet of construction. And looking at the savings by having everything IP and leveraging uh, an integration platform, that's where we're seeing savings well over $2 million per 100,000 square feet of construction. So it is getting people's attention. It is changing the way that end users are thinking about their building and how the design teams are designing their buildings. We were recently involved in a project uh, that uh, wrapped up towards the end of, uh, of last year. And they took this methodology as far as uh, any, of, any customer that we've worked with. They wanted a POE of everything type scenario. And in doing that, uh, they had over 55,000 watts of POE lighting. Uh, over 8,000 connected devices in the building. And I should mention it's about an 88,000 square foot building. Uh, because of that, we used over 950 reels of category 6A cable. Um, there are over 100 different lighting systems and configurations in the building, serviced by over 60 POE switches. And the lights came from 20 different custom lighting manufacturers. So we're really able to customize the approach. They want a very high end uh, edge devices and uh, the market was able to deliver on that. So, Dave, I think that kind of sets a good table uh, as to why we're doing the intelligent building things. Let's uh, kick it over to you so we can talk about uh, how we best support them on the infrastructure side. Okay, fair enough. Thanks, Bob. I'm going to try to share my screen now. I just need you to, there we go. 
I'm going to pop Share quickly. I made myself really big. Okay. Yeah. Looking, tell me, tell me if you can see it. In there. <laughs> can you guys yeah, see yeah. my screen okay? Not yet. All right. Let's see what we got here. Let's try it now. Share screen. All right. Let me know if that works. No, we're still seeing Bob's handsome face. Oh my God, that's well. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I don't want to judge. So, uh, Dave, I'm trying to pull it up on mine too, just as a backup. So keep working on yours. I got it here. How's that? Uh, where'd there. I go? Okay. Well, there we're we seeing go. your we're seeing your PowerPoint, but we're not seeing in presenter mode. There, there it we is. Go. There we go. Now How's presenting. that? All right. So I'll pick up where, where Bob left off and really talk about you know what he he had some great messages there as Ching's transition over IP and so. When, when you're especially uh, implications, everything going over IP is usually taking advantage of, of remote powering. So, but there are implications associated with that. So I won't spend a lot of time with this because I think a lot of our audience is familiar with the remote powering, but it's really kind of taken a, more of an impact as we introduced uh, types three and type four POE um, to really start thinking more and more about the implications for the, the structured cabling uh, on that. When you deliver power, obviously you're, you're adding heat and there's a lot of I say there's a lot, but there's a manageable number of, of implications that we'll want to talk about today to make sure that you're properly prepared for it and then figure out, you know, some, some ideas on how you can address that uh, during the installation of this low voltage cabling. So the, the, the primary things that we're going to deal with is obviously the, the heat buildup within the cabling as you, as you add power to the communications in addition to that. But we can, we can do things. We can manage the length. We can reduce bundle sizes, and we'll talk about that. And then there's the connectivity element uh, when, you're, when you're disconnecting from powered connection and also how you can address address that. So we'll walk through that as well. So when you talk about temperature rise of the cable, um, because you are introducing power in addition to the communication there, you're going to typically get a, a heat rise associated with that. Now, you know, when, when, when you were actually uh, talking about the characteristics of structured cabling, the insertion loss is actually evaluated about 20 degrees C or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, a lot of your environments are going to be warmer than that, and there's going to be additional heat buildup in your cable. So the impact of that has to be managed from how you allow how much you allow for the heat buildup and then what can you do to offset the implications of that especially from a, an insertion loss perspective which is what we're most concerned with now um you also don't want to exceed the, the jacket rating of a cable. And, and we're not talking about a situation where cables are going to spontaneously combust or melt or anything. As entertaining as that might be, it doesn't sound like the safety things that Bob would like to see in an intelligent building. So it's really just talks about uh, if you're going above that consistently, you're going to degrade the cable you know, beyond what the expected lifespan is in terms of its overall construction. So we want to make sure that typically you don't exceed cabling above 60 degrees C, which is about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And what you're seeing to address that is that's what typically cables are rated to, but you're seeing more constructions uh, come out now that have higher jacket ratings, for example, 75 degrees C uh, to address specifically this, this heat buildup. So what happens is depending on the amount of current you apply, whether it's type one, which is the 15 watts, type two or three, which we're talking 30 and 60 watts or type four, which gets up closer to 90 watts, um, you have a, a, a temperature rise in the cable bundles and it changes uh, depending on the category of cabling. So category 5E, for example, is, is, least, is, is less tolerant of it because simply it has smaller conductors of all of them. As you go up the ladder, you go to category 6, category 6A, category 6A shielded, and even category 7A, which is a fully shielded system. It has the ability to manage that heat dissipation uh, better over that uh, the length of that cabling run. So ultimately what you end up with is that as the, you have to have a certain level of derating uh, if you're addressing temperatures to go up to 60 degrees. And when we say up to 60 degrees, we're assuming uh, an ambient temperature of about 45 degrees C with a heat rise of about 15 degrees C, which gets you up to the 60 degrees C, which is the, again, the typical you know, jacket rating of, of these cables. So if you look at these types of things, you see that along the way here, um, if you were in an environment like that, you would actually have to reduce your, your category 6A UTP cabling up to 18 meters at 60 degrees C, which is significant in a 100 meter channel. That's about a 20% derating um, to address and manage that insertion loss. If you bring it down to a category 6A shielded system, um, that, that comes significantly drops from 18 meter reduction to a seven meter reduction. So certainly more manageable for doing that if you're aware of, of how, to, how to design your, your telecommunications rooms and distributing your cable plant. Um, to keep within that overall 93 meter channel. And then we actually have some properties within our Siemens category 6A 
uh, FUTB cable uh, construction that allows that derating to be limited to only three meters. So now you can have up to a 97 meter channel, even in the worst case scenario. And, and keep in mind that worst case scenario may not be day one when you're maybe doing a few devices with PoE, maybe it's only type one, type two, but your infrastructure is designed to, to, to last for 10, 15, 20 years. And by then you can imagine there's gonna be more devices that are gonna be running potentially at higher PoE levels. So you wanna start planning for this now and not when it becomes a problem. And certainly uh, when you get to something like category 7A, which is not as common in North America, but is used uh, globally, it's a fully shielded cable, which means it's individually shielded pairs with an overall um, braid. And that actually has no derating up to 60 degrees C. So I think it's it might become a medium where people are gonna consider something like that to take out the heat rise effect, knowing that you can still terminate that, for example, on a category 6A shielded jack to give yourself a category 6A channel that doesn't require any derating along the way. Um, now, when we talk about connectivity, um, what really comes into play is when you have a power device, there's always a handshake. It's never delivering power from the PoE switch to the PoE device until it actually has a handshake. And once it has that handshake, it's going to operate as usual. So the only situations where you're worried about this arcing under load is if you disconnect a live port uh, from the end device. And what are the implications to your structured cabling on that? Well, if you unplug it from the jack side, uh, the patch cord may be running from the outlet to the end device, and you unplug it from the jack side, you can actually create uh, damage to the contacts over time. So because there is a small spark gap that, that's created as a result of that. So that can actually um, kind of reduce the performance of your connectivity from a physical perspective, as we've shown in the illustrations here. Um, because what you're really factoring into play here is when you, you have a, a, a an un, you know, you have a mating situation, as soon as that plug uh, makes contact with it, and then you have a, 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 ultimately you have a final position where the plug and jack are fully mated. And you need to make sure that, that especially where that plug and jack are fully mated, that you don't have damage on, on both sides of the contact there that you might get along the way. So we see on top is kind of a standard legacy RJ45 just has straight contacts. And it gets a little bit of damage. If it gets damaged when it gets disconnected on the plug tip, well, look, that plug tip now is sitting at a point of, of damage. Even though the jack contact is not damaged in that area, the plug tip is. So you can have some erosion and, and, and kind of intermediate issues. On the bottom, it shows uh, a crown contact design where you're still going to get damage on that plug tip. And even at that point on the jack contact where it disengages, but when it's in its fully mated position, you can see it's at an undamaged location. And it's important to consider that. And, you know, there's actually uh, and some... Uh, IEC test specifications that connectivity can be tested to that ensures full compliance with these mating and unmating cycles. Uh, there's there's two specifications, one that addresses PoE types one and two, and the other one that references to PoE types three and four. So when you're looking for connectivity, you just want to look for something that has been tested at that to confirm you're going to be okay, not only for today, but, but also in the future. So uh, next step that I want to talk about that's coming to play with a lot of PoE devices, as Bob mentioned, these PoE devices aren't computers or phones or something that's simply at a, at a, at a workstation. These are devices that are, are on a wall or perhaps above a ceiling or mounted in the ceiling. And as a result, they're not always suitable for a location to have an outlet and a patch cord. And, and obviously it's good that if there's benefits to having that, we don't want to move away from that. It's great for administration. It gives you a little bit more flexi flexibility in terms of moving cabling around in the future for different devices. But um, what they realize is that there, there is a need in some cases, even though it kind of goes against the structured cabling rules, to terminate the end of your horizontal cabling in a, in a modular plug and just plugging it into the device. And it's really the rise of these IP tied devices that led to this type of um, situation. It's really designed for being by exception, but there's kind of been a, a, a fairly reasonable market uptake in that simply because of the, the mounting limitations for putting an outlet nearby. So when you think about some of these devices, whether it be wireless access points or security cameras or building automation systems or time and alarm systems or time and attendance systems even, um, we see people migrating toward that. And it is a recognized topology within the TIA standards. Um, but one thing that we'd want to consider here that we really want to talk to is that if you're going to do that, you, you, you lose some of the flexibility at the workstation end without having an outlet in terms of if that device moves a little bit or if you want to repurpose that cable for another IP device. So in those cases, um, the, the consolidation point kind of something that you should you should really consider to bring back into play. And, and I think folks remember consolidation points from the days of open office cabling, where you might have a, a people moving workstations around or workstations being reconfigured. And the concept was to introduce a consolidation point there because it made the move ad chains easier, right? Because you're, you're installing permanent cabling from your telecommunications room out to your consolidation point. 
but from there, you have the flexibility of doing shorter runs that are less disruptive to your end devices. So the same concept kind of applies as you work toward intelligent buildings, it gives you a lot more flexibility because you don't know how many more devices you're gonna be adding from an IP perspective. So designing the infrastructure from a telecommunications room to the consolidation point properly day one will give you that flexibility. And then as devices change and move, you really limit the disruption and the cost of doing some of those moves. So the combination of these two, I'd say if you're using one of these modular plug terminated links where you have a plug at the end of the device, you should always be using a consolidation point to help manage that infrastructure and not really let you get away to become more of a point to point cabling scenario. So how do we address some of these POE rises? Well, TIA had issued a, a TSB, which is a technical service bulletin in 2018, which are for informational purposes. And it really talked about how do you, how do you manage that? And we talked about the heat rise going from 45 to 60 C. And what the summary was in the recommendations here is basically, and it's larger conductors and shields help reduce heat dissipation. And it, it, the larger conductor one is, is kind of more intuitive, bigger copper, bigger pipe, makes it easy, less heat build up. But shields is something that I think a lot of people didn't really give much consideration to, but it's surprising the impact of that. Now, keeping in mind that when you're designing that and selecting your infrastructure, et cetera, you're looking at the worst case one meter segment of that entire channel as a basis for what you're gonna do and how you're gonna bundle and consider some of these types of things. So. Um, the mitigation recommendations for managing remote powering are, are, are actually kind of simple. It's a twofold approach. You just use the largest conductors you can, which in North America recognized is category 6A or higher. I guess if you wanted to talk about maybe, I don't want to get into it, but a category eight cable uh, that's really a limited application use. But 7A is, is something you could use in North America that's a larger gauge. We're now we're talking like, you know, 23, 22 gauge. And then install shielded cables. Um, and if you don't do any of that stuff or you need to, you have to reduce your overall channel length. So if you put those two together, the message behind the message is category 6A shielded cabling is, is the best you can do for managing remote powering uh, as, as per North American standards. Now, other ways that you can, that's kind of from the media perspective, but from the installation perspective, how else can I, can I help dissipate this? Well, one of them is to reduce those cable bundle sizes. And it's not so bad when it's kind of out near the work area and the pathways, whether it be the J hooks or the basket trays, but as you get closer to a telecommunication room, those bundles increase and increase and increase even within the room itself. And what they found in the studies is if you take those bundles and to reduce it. So an example here, it's, it's 90 cables. If you took those 90 cables and, and reduce them into three groups of 30 cables, it reduces the heat on the center cables by 25%. Further, if you add an inch of separation, it reduces the heat on those central cables another 30%. So, you know, it's simply moving away from those big bundles and getting away to manage more managed bundles is a good thing. Um, what we typically recommend is limit those cable bundles to 24 as they come back in. Why? Because that aligns with your patch panel counts. It's an easy number to remember. And as you see, you'll see on one of our cable dissipation tables, um, it kind of matches the number for what you can do with category 6a shielded cabling uh, the allowable cable bundle sizes so um, this here is, is a manufacturer guideline this happens to be siemens a lot of manufacturers may have it it talks about the the bundle size uh the maximum bundle size for different media types as you go from the top of the screen which is type 1 poe all the way down to uh type 4 poe operating at that 60 degree limit that we talked about so actually getting up to 75 degrees c overall with the heat rise and as you can see for category 6a shielded in category 7a that magical number of 24 applies um keeping those 24 cable bundles makes a lot of sense. Even if you look at type four with a maximum ambient temperature of 45 degrees C, which is, you know, I think it's suitable for many customers, you can get up to 24 cable bundles, even with category 5E and 6 uh, and 6A UTP as well. So that 24 is a good number. If you just don't know, it's a great general practice rule to just apply this across for your designs, and then you don't have to have as much consideration for the rest of the insulation. Um, and then there's also a TSB, another technical service bulletin that talked about the use of 28 gauge cords, which have come out in the last couple of years, the smaller diameter patch cords. Uh, the only problem is their findings were to effectively do that, uh, keep your bundle sizes to 12 and keep them an inch and a half and apart. And, and I think that's a great engineering practice, but I don't think that's a great practical practice. As, as you know, if you go into your horizontal and vertical management, it's, it's, it's really not practical to, to bundle those cables uh, and keep them an inch and a half apart. Um, so I would say at the very least, try to limit your, you know, if you're doing 28 gauge cords in a POE application, try to limit your bundle size to at least a group of 12. That's certainly going to help. And between some of the randomness and the pathways and the cable, maybe Velcro cable ties, you'll be able to achieve some level of, of dissipation there. 
And then finally, within the, the latest, there was an addendum to the TIA 569 Pathways and Spaces standard a few years ago that's been incorporated into the newest uh, revision E that came out this year that really looked about, you know, how do we address this remote powering from a pathway perspective? And what they came up with, the things that are, uh, frankly, mostly intuitive, right? So the, the first one is when you get to pathway types and the ability to dissipate heat, um, non-continuous uh, pathways like J-hooks are the best at dissipating heat, right? They're, they're hardly even coming to play in your pathway at all in terms of um, containing bundles or, you know, uh, not allowing the cables to have access to open air. As you get into um, conduit pathways or closed pathways, obviously they have a very, very low capability to do heat dissipation because the cables just don't have the ability to breathe in there. There's just not uh, access to the open air. Um, when you get to the bottom there and you talk about uh, ladder trays, which are really right behind uh, J-hooks is the best option available. Um, obviously open wire mesh basket trays are, are the best, but you, had, you could have a solid ventilated uh, cable tray, which does okay. And you can have an unventilated, just straight up solid um, ladder tray, which is kind of the worst of the open system. So a lot of these things are be intuitive. When you're thinking about pathways, you're trying to try to avoid the conduit where you can. You want to go to as much of a mesh or J-hook pathway as you can to allow access to that ambient air and allow those cables to dissipate heat just through their, their space. So just wrapping up here, uh, if we look at some of the, the categories in, uh, you know, from 5E all the way up to 7A, uh, you know, I've applied some, some just baseline kind of costs from a materials only perspective. And when you consider materials are only a small percentage of the overall cabling insulation, when you think about the labor to install, terminate, test, administer, uh, all that sort of stuff. So you have to kind of take the, the data with a grain of salt, but I just want to put it as a relevant point here along the way. But when you, you know, we, we've put a lot of factors in here, everything from, from cable OD, termination speeds, et cetera. But the, the key to start thinking about as it relates to POE as it is starting with heat dissipation. And as you can see, and you expect from category 5E being the worst all the way up to category 7A being the best, simply because of introduction of shields and larger conductors. So the lengthy rating goes hand in hand with that, where you have the ability to do less lengthy rating as you get better with the cables. And these bundle sizes are the ones that we talked about in a 60 degree C environment where the heat dissipation goes up. Um, and because the heat rise allows it to get up to 75 degree C and you're really can't support that with category 5e or 6. So um, just some, some food for thought uh, in terms of weighing these things, which is really why we talk to our customers and say, even if it's sometimes for, unless it's a, a low speed, um, low power application where you don't ever see that to change, you really should be thinking that if it's either high speed or high power to be thinking about category 6a cabling, again, for the life of that cabling system, for what it's going to support, not only day one, but year one and year five, and maybe even year 10, depending on your infrastructure. It's got the best capability of supporting higher speeds. Category 5e and 6 are a gigabit per second application, so one gig. Category 6a supports full 10 gig uh, and beyond. So that's what you want to consider for, for bandwidth when you think about uh, applications such as Wi-Fi or DAS that may use some of these higher speeds. So we have some uh, additional guidelines on our website at seaman.com where you can learn more about this kind of stuff. But with that, I will uh, wrap up for today and, uh, and turn things back over. Whoo, Dave and Bob, you guys are fast talkers, my friends. You get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, we're right at our time. We're at about, we used up 29 of our 30 minutes, but I do want to ask a couple of quick questions for you guys right now. And by the way, everybody out there watching, go ahead and submit your questions for Bob and Dave. They're the experts in this. Um, I want to know a little bit, I know about, I know zone cabling is a thing. But where does zone cabling really come into play with this building PoE automation and intelligent building? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. And actually, the, the, the challenge is, is that the, the intelligent building is still a lot of unknown for some people. So you're trying to... To, to cable for something that you don't really know how much it's going to apply yet. Now, as, as IP enabled applications roll out, you can certainly add more switches in your closet. You can add more cabling from your telecommunications room out to these devices, um, and that's all well and good, but there is a disruption and a cost associated with that. So with structured cabling, you're trying to get ahead of this and, and really get a get a good solid infrastructure that's going to last you uh, a fairly long time. And it depends on if your facility is a lease or if it's, if it's an own, a lot of those things may come into play. but getting some some a, a fair amount of quantity of cabling from your telecommunications room out to your zone box day one um, to allow you to to get some of these devices as, as bob mentioned you're sure it was voice over ip and security cameras and now it's poe lighting but we know it's more and more um, uh, trends are going to move toward the this ip enabled technology so 
you don't want to have to keep going into your telecommunications room. You don't want to have to keep going through the space between your telecommunications room and those devices to install more cabling, especially if you're like here in a manufacturing environment. I'm in an office here, but we have very high ceilings, so it's very difficult to install cablings cost effectively. So getting that a decent infrastructure between your telecommunications room and a zone box really prepares that space to um, have that flexibility and future proofing to add a device here, add a device there as they become more IP enabled with less disruption. So it's a little bit, I've called it an insurance policy of sorts because you're going to pay a little bit more to get that infrastructure between your telecommunications room and the zone box in place up front, but you're going to save that on the back end as you add devices uh, down the line. So maybe you're not, uh, you know, obviously if it's a, if it's a green build, a green field construction, you're going to be thinking about POE lighting. Um, and you wouldn't probably have to upgrade for that later, but you expect more building automation systems, especially um, to become more prevalent. It's possible with Wi-Fi going to higher speeds, they're gonna require greater density, so that more drops required for some of those. So you really, it's an insurance policy, if you will. And honestly, it's just a good practice from design perspective, um, because it's not like uh, the days of old where you had workstations and it was a finite amount of cabling. It's just, it's, it's a little bit of the unknown. So just gives you the flexibility to plan ahead, and really just be prepared if you if you have plans to have an intelligent building. Makes your building plug and play, right? You can add devices as we go. And you mentioned you do PE lighting from the beginning, but you know it's likely that at some point you're gonna be adding a light fixture or reconfiguring light fixtures based on the use of that space. It makes it very easy and cost effective to do that. True, true. And I was gonna ask you guys, how do you justify it to the owner, right? Because I'm sure every every cable installer is like, heck yeah, I'll install more cables and I'll more install more equipment. But the the real idea is the owners have to decide it's the right financial investment. So, what what can the installers and the cable guys tell to the owners that is the justification and the reasoning? We've heard the insurance, but you know ROI is king. Do you guys have what would you tell to the what, what would you tell to your installers? Yeah. Well, if you if you go back to the beginning of the presentation, we we're talking about leveraging things like POE and the fact we can save over $2 million per 100,000 square feet of new construction. The cost of running a few extra cables is really an insignificant number. Um, when Dave says we're cabling, uh, providing additional cables, we're really looking at in a 24 port zone enclosure, kind of planning uh, original port uh, port density to maybe 20, 22 ports of that zone enclosure. So we're really maybe only running two to four per enclosure that um, that we may not be using day one to provide that flexibility as new applications come out, um, as the needs of the building changes, tenants change, uses change, and so on. Yeah, it becomes a little bit of a, a, a capex, opex kind of discussion, perhaps. Um, you know, if you want to invest a little bit more in that capex day one, you can get yourself a lower opex down there. So it, it depends on the model. You're right. I mean, depending on how you budget, but I, I find it's usually a lot easier to get an approved budget day one than to keep coming back for money in, in year one, year two, every time a new technology is released. So it could, uh, it, I'm guessing as a, if you're a, a CTO or a, a, you know, a CIO, um, you're going to, you're going to look good as this building progresses over time, because it's not really if the building becomes intelligent, it's going to become intelligent over time. I think whether you're planning for it or whether you're not planning for it. So having yourself prepared up front is, is a story to tell. And, and I think a lot of cases that it's not so much of an issue with the installer. It, it's, we have these discussions with the consultants that are doing designs. More importantly, we have discussions with end users, but ultimately the customers is paying the bill for that. And so that's, that's where, you know, Bob spends a lot of his time with those customers, having those conversations up front, um, really just to prepare them for it. So getting buy-in, it really depends on where they are financially, but I think most people understand it's coming. So if they're willing to do the little bit of CapEx now, like we said in that, that little, it's not like we're adding more zone enclosure, we're adding a more cables to the zone enclosure and the big picture of an infrastructure for say a floor or a wing of a building when you factor in the labor those added cables are, are not that significant to the overall and that's the time really that you're going to be in there when the spaces aren't populated it's when the spaces are populated that you're usually having to come in and add these cables and do this work uh, over time which is really time and a half versus the straight time you're going to pay day one to the cabling to that zone enclosure fantastic well guys we have taken an extra five minutes and i appreciate it and um, I'm gonna wrap us up, tell everybody to meet you guys over at the Big C booth. So let's go ahead and switch over. Thank you, Great. Bob. Thank you, Dave, appreciate it. Uh, you guys have been fantastic. And I really appreciate their time and the presentation today. I learned a lot. I was taking a lot of notes. Now, Tom and Dave, or sorry, Bob and Dave. Bob and Dave are gonna be over at our Big C booth. 
here for the next few minutes, ready to take chat questions. If you want to ask some questions, um, hit them up with a tough question. One that I, I wanted to ask, but I didn't get the chance to ask him is, there are people coming out with Cat 5e cable rated for high power PoE, but they told us to go Cat 6. Why? Now, I don't want to spoil it for them, so check them out on the chat line over at Bixie. And if you don't have a pass to go to Bixie, don't worry, I'll throw in the chat um, a free pass where you can register and see all the other presentations today we're doing. Later today, we're meeting with Igor about maximizing your IoT. We are going to also be talking about networking for intelligent buildings and power with Louis Saus, ex-Cisco um, executive. And we're also going to be talking about wellness and leads with Samfi and motorized blinds and shades. So that's all coming up. Don't miss it. So we'll see you in about two hours with Igor. Y'all have a great morning and we'll see you up over there on uh, Bixie. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Bob. I thought you were going to say the hard question was, who was, do we go to the same barber? <laughs> I'll see you on the other side. <laughs>